Blair Rubio, Director of Marketing here at T1B. I'm going to ask my panelists to introduce themselves and just say a few words about your role and what you do with your respective company. And then I'll just start kind of our two lines of questioning. So the first line of questioning is going to be kind of focused a bit more on the active learning side. So Brent is going to kind of lead a lot of those questions. And then Jim and Frank are going to weigh in with their opinions as well. And then we'll kind of switch focuses over to the collaboration side. Um, so with that, I'll let Frank, do you want to kick it off? Yeah, sure. So I'm Frank Molesky. Uh, I run the Charlotte office for Scenario. We are a top 20 uh, audiovisual design integration unified communications firm in Charlotte. So we service the private higher education market, corporate environment, um, everything from interactive spaces to video walls and unified communication. Hello, my name is Brent Babb. I work for Wake Forest University. I'm the Assistant Director of IT Infrastructure with an emphasis on multimedia. Um, we support a little over 400, 450 spaces on campus from uh, classrooms to event spaces and anything that incorporates that kind of multimedia technology. And hello, I'm Jim Morris. I'm the CTO here at T1V. Uh, and in my role, I focus on kind of new technologies, new products that we're going to bring to the market. You know, I get involved with our kind of key customers and understand their use cases and make sure that we're designing the right products to fit their needs. So. Great. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for having Appreciate us. Appreciate having you. Yeah. So uh, the first question I'm going to throw out is, can you provide an overview of trends you're seeing in the classroom um, and discuss you know, your experience to date with active learning spaces and flipped learning? Sure. Um, so the, the trends in higher ed, I've been in higher ed for uh, j just over 20 years. And so what we're seeing in higher ed is a transition from um, digital and flipped and um, active learning classrooms as opposed to lecture-based classrooms. Um, but what the challenging factor is, is you have um, faculty members who are more fluid than in a K through 12 environment. And so in that transition, when you have an active learning classroom or a flipped classroom or those types of, of spaces, you have to make sure you train the, the um, professors on how to use those. So we're being really strategic on where we place those in the, in the college environment and making sure that we are utilizing them correctly because it's a lot of expense for technology. Yeah, and some of the things that we see, uh, you know, interacting with, uh, you know, with these universities and this, the trends that we see probably is two main trends. One is the active learning <coughs> type environments that are that are coming on, um, and you know these these have been around for a while. I think uh, what we're seeing now is you know creating them with the right use cases to make them easy to use, and so that professors can walk right in and understand how to use it, and they don't have to get you know so much training on you know on lots of switching equipment that they figure out how to use it because. If it's, if it's too hard, they just really won't use it. It needs to be simple and easy to use, something they can learn in, in just a few minutes. So we're definitely seeing that. Uh, I think also we're seeing you know, a push toward supporting BYOD from all the students in small huddle space kind of environments. So we see kind of both of those two things you know, happening in the, in the university areas. You know. Great. Uh, what have been some of the biggest challenges you've come up against in the past when trying to upgrade existing classrooms? Uh, great question. Um, ease of use, uh, you, said, you hit the nail on the head. Ease of use is, is the number one goal. If a faculty member, professor, or an event person coming in, or a guest member, if they can come in and connect to the system and use it, we've all succeeded in, in our jobs. Um, so ease of use is, is one of those. Um, and what was the other part of the question? The um, you know, when you're trying to upgrade classroom technology, upgrading. what are the hurdles there? So upgrading technology, it's, it's important to know that it's not a one-size-fits-all. It is really a, um, a needs-based design space. So what I mean by that is instead of going in and just upgrading technology for what was there and replicating the same things that you had in the classroom prior, Go in and speak to the faculty and, and the chairs of the departments and the people that are using the spaces in the administration or whoever it is and ask them how they're using the space. Ask the right questions and design that space around how they're using it. Don't just mirror it and put it in there and walk away. So I, that's the biggest thing that we're seeing. We're not, um, I, I call it database 
classroom design or database AV design. Mm -hmm. um, and I know we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, I mean, we, we do, I think that was, that was key there, being flexible. I mean, we see uh, a lot, even, even though we've, we've come up with some designs that we've worked with, you know, for example, we've shown, shown before at Texas A&M, you know, for some kind of optimum designs for these active learning classrooms. But when we take them to other universities, they all have a slight twist on how they want to use it maybe a little differently. And so, you know, having the capability to be flexible, to put different, you know, different types of use cases and have them fit well uh, by, by making some changes in the technology is important. For us, it's adoption, um, making sure you have a, a training and migration path for that new technology. Um, as you have a, a baseline standard, uh, when you do these technology upgrades and invest in something new uh, to solve a business or educational application, it's, it's having a champion that helps roll it out, support it, um, and teach in the technology that the instructors want, um, not just what maybe the software or the technology provides. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, John touched on BYOD in his presentation. How do you guys see BYOD changing the way teachers and students are interacting in the classroom? Um, so we at Wake Forest are BYOD um, space. Um, so we, we've had some challenges, um, all good challenges, and it's really just a matter of how to make the equipment function easy for the user base. Um, when we start thinking about interactive classrooms and spaces, um, what we're finding is really they just want to mirror their image. So if a student wants to share what they're doing in a, in a, um, on a worksheet or whatever, they want to just mirror that. They don't want to interact and raise their hand and do all those types of things. So we're, we're really, we're now starting to cross that barrier of they expect it to mirror in the classroom. They expect to be able to share their presentation. They expect to be able to do all these things. Um, the next step, I think, is going to be the collaborative piece to that. And at, at, at Wake Forest, we're just, we're there, but it's, it's real um, specific. It's a specific need and a specific class and a specific discipline that needs that collaborative piece. Mm -hmm. So for us, one of the things we notice with BYOD Challenge is it's a third-party application uh, or third-party source provider. Um, it's important that the company such as T1V or, or others that may exist that are dedicated to this space is that, you know, I know some of the folks in the room can attest to using iPads, for example, is that um, we can have everything working and if a student or a faculty member updates software overnight mm -hmm. and there's not a good software application team behind the scenes dedicated to that environment, the end, the end result is, is we're left holding the bag. I don't think anyone calls uh, uh, Bellevue or uh, in Northern California gets support for those kind of things. So um, that, that's a big challenge for us and, and many of our ed, ed clients. Yeah, and, and I would echo on that and say that once it breaks that first time, they've lost, lost the confidence in using the tech. So confidence is another big key in the, in the um, education space. Yeah, I was going to comment about you know, we've seen in, in rollouts that we've done in, uh, in universities that uh, it, it's, it's pretty impressive. I mean, the students completely embrace it and pick it up very quickly. You know, they, they don't even need any training on anything. They just walk in the room. Maybe you haven't even told them they should use it yet. They're already like, logged in, doing it, sharing their screens and all this stuff. Um, you know, the, the trick then is really do you get the professors to be able to use the same kind of technology? And so. Um, you know, having technology that lets people bring any device that they have, you know, Android, iPhone, Windows, Mac, whatever, and being able to share that is, is real important. It also needs to be really, you know, it also needs to be easy enough that you can get the professors to kind of embrace that and start using it also. And, um, you know, I think a lot of that is really key around the software that you're using and how, you know, and how it's designed. So we spend a lot of time, you know, trying to focus on that as an organization. Are you utilizing interactive touch screens and displays in the classroom? And if not, why not? And uh, do you have any plans to do so in the future? Um, yes, we are, but it's very specific. It's a target audience. Um, what we're finding, again, is one of those spaces where if we <coughs> deploy a lot of this technology that they're just not using it quite yet. Mm -hmm. And so the, the cost of a display versus a cost of a touch display and how they're going to use it is just we have to weigh those factors and so in higher ed and education in general you know budget is a big concern and you only get 
so many chances to do this, you know, where corporate world might be a little bit different. So we have to be real, um, real focused on where we put pieces of technology and make sure the adoption is well received before deploying in many places. So we're there, we're getting there. It's coming faster than probably our budget can keep up with maybe or any higher ed or for that matter, but um, it, it's, it's happening because it's on their device at home every day. Yeah, and um, I, I think in, in our active learning experience classrooms that we've done, you know, almost all of those designs, they have a touch screen for the professor uh, to use. And it's really his way to control everything in the room. So we, we definitely see that, um, you know, and as a technology company, we try to develop, you know, all kind of elaborate solutions for all kinds of use cases. But we've seen kind of in, the, in those active learning spaces that, where the students are located, you know, it's not really as important to have a touch screen. They're, they're really kind of sitting in a small group. They want to show content to each other, kind of talk about it face to face. They don't necessarily need to have touch screens in those, those areas, even though we do get in a lot of discussions with the universities where their first impact is, hey, I need a touch screen everywhere. You know, all the students need touch screens, the professor needs touch screens. And then you know, a lot of times when we go through the real use case and what they're going to use to find out, doesn't really buy you much except uh, you know it's just cool you know and, and it's not really going to get used as much as, as they might think so I think it is important to think about the use cases as, as you talked about where it's really you know where is it important really to have touch touch screens located um, and you know so, sometimes it's just to have it to uh, you know to make the whole you know to make all the features that you want to do in the room easy to do you know so that's that's a big reason also Right. Where do you see technology in the classroom five, ten years from now? <laughs> technology in the classroom is definitely growing, but it's growing um, in a simplistic way. And what I mean by that is everybody's going to want it wireless and they're going to want to be able to take their BYOD device and display content up there and control everything they want from that piece. Um, we're seeing a, a big shift in um, wireless first and actually we're, we're kind of leading that charge at the university we've deployed a lot of wireless um, systems across campus and and it and different manufacturers to be honest um, because again needs based and and that type of stuff but um, most people don't want to connect to a wire and if you think about the the connections of USB USB-C mini displayed it after all those things and then if you align that with education and how many classrooms we support, and we have to put those in every single classroom. You're talking a major budget, a budget hit every year, and the, the, the durability that those things have to withstand from the faculty um, and the students and getting stolen and all that kind of stuff. It all has to be factored in. Um, so I think technology really in the classroom is going wireless. I, that would be my prediction. Yeah, so what we see from an integration perspective are probably the following three things. Uh, AV over IP is taking over and it will take over. Um, and in something like Wake Forest, they're an older building that's 100 years old. How do you utilize the same thing? Why is your audiovisual integrator pulling the same cables? The other is software-based conferencing, software-based uh, audiovisual. And, and now the transition to AV as a service. Um, you have phone systems as a service, you have software as a service. Um, we're starting to see that as well. Um, different budgets, different migrations of that, but is our most popular conversation um, at the moment. And as you look at a larger initiative, multi-floor, multi-classroom, multi-site, um, it is definitely the most prevalent thing in the industry currently. Yeah, I totally, totally agree with that. I mean, this, this push toward, toward using more software-based solutions and in replace of hardware-centric, you know, hardware single-use kind of situation, you know, single-use solutions, you know, and replacing those with more generic solution that you can just upgrade the software and get new features and different capabilities over time. That's definitely, I think, I mean, I kind of think that's how the whole industry is moving, really, and it's definitely, you know, definitely showing up in, in higher education. Yeah. I would say we're, we're, we're definitely cloud first. Um, cloud first is our approach. Anything that we look at, we're cloud first. Mm -hmm. um, so we've actually uh, migrated our um, AV monitoring system to cloud first. And now I get weekly reports on a Monday morning that our um, tech team can go out and respond to tickets or problems in a classroom before a faculty member can even 
go into the space and have a problem. So, so we're looking at cloud first too. Great. I'm going to transition now over into kind of the collaboration side of our questioning. Um, but you mentioned analytics and data previously, so I think that's a good way to parlay into, you know, are you using database or analytics based uh, design in any of your projects? And can you elaborate on maybe how this has impacted the way that you're planning for future deployments? Frank? Yeah, so um, <laughs> Scenario uh, started the analytics of audiovisual years ago, right? And that's been our claim to fame and others just caught up to that um, from end users to also some others in the marketplace. but. Um, it's using data to make the, tr the decisions for audiovisual. Um, you know, Brent's campus is a perfect example of, I need, or as Jim said, I need a whiteboard everywhere. Well, what are you going to use it for? Or I need an interactive board everywhere. Um, so being able to take that to the next budget cycle and say we deployed X, now what was the, what was the success or the success criteria? Um, what was the adoption? And either the technology wasn't good the application wasn't good, or we didn't do a good job training our staff. Um, take that uh, you know, to a CFO for a next level of funding, and you have a whole different conversation around uh, organizational budgets and, and things like that, funding. Um, and then as far as monitoring and metrics, you've been able to manage your switches, your codecs, your phones for all these years. Why not the software and the audiovisual systems? Um, so it is the industry now. Uh, which goes yeah, I mean, we, uh, we see that in almost every kind of project that we do. Um, you know, and, and I think there's two, two big places, you know, being able to report all of this data, you know, how things are being used, status of devices, first lead into, uh, you know, having, you know, very fast response on support on the support side. Uh, but then taking that same data and using that, you know, to build up, hey, these are the features people are really using. I mean, we use it ourselves to decide you know, what are the most important features, what are the pain points that we see customers using, and then, you know, our, our customers use it to help decide, you know, what technology they really want to implement and whether they got their ROI on it or not. So, um, you know, it's, it's definitely huge in the, in the space now. Yeah, yeah for, um, for Wake Forest, I, I have this little presentation that I um, take to administration um, and others and share it, and it's called Database Classroom Design. And so when I first got to Wake Forest, I deployed a, a system um, through AMX, it's an AMX um, remote monitoring system. Um, but anyway, I moved it to the cloud and then I started collecting information off classrooms because what we were finding is um, professors wanted to just have what they had before. And who are we, and we being IS or anybody else, to tell them that, that they can't have it. Um, so we would deploy it, and we would, we would manage it, and we would supervise it, you know, and train and all that stuff. Um, in the end, it turned out, by collecting that data, and we did it over a couple, couple semesters, because you can't do it off one semester, um, we found out that they are actually using it a certain way. And then we took that model, and we developed a classroom standard of, of that system. And so now we have three systems. That captures our 80% that, that fit that model, so to speak. And then we have that 20% for the interactive, the flipped classrooms and those spaces. And I think we'll eventually see the shift if we continue to go online learning for flipped and interactive and we'll just continue rotating that. So, so what it's actually done is it's made our return on investment huge because if I don't have to train or we don't have to train anybody, then we succeeded. And that's what we're seeing in our very simple classrooms that somebody just wants to come in, present their stuff and walk out the door um, so no training means success for us. Yeah, I just kind of additional comment. I mean, uh, you know, you you'd seen our thing about Texas A&M installation that we did. I think a big, you know, a big worry that the, uh, you know, that the uh, Texas A&M University had about those rooms were were the professors really gonna take hold to the technology and use it? And um, you know, they you know they they had this interactive whiteboard that the professors were gonna. I, you know, ideally write all their notes on. They still had the other whiteboards on the side just in case, but uh, the metrics that they got out of the first week, you know, they were just so happy when they, when they saw all the data, you know, and uh, you know, that, that there was like miles and miles of annotations done just by professors in the first week. And uh, you know, without that data, it's really, you know, it was really a lot more subjective. But once they, once they start getting the raw data, 
they, you know, they're able to make decisions and they're like, oh wow, this is definitely way more than a success than we thought it was going to be in the first week. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it's key. Yeah. And I, I, I actually want to say that showing the customer or your professor, whoever, the data, so it's in front of them, so they don't just hear what you're saying, they see what you're saying, is a big factor in making the decision. So if you lay out this data, for example, in a, in a pie graph form and, and you have your input usage and how they use the system for the last 24 months, they see it and they understand and they're right on your side and you move on about it and, and install the right software or the right system. Great, thank you. How is video collaboration changing the way people are interacting and communicating with one another? So for us, yeah, you could jump in as well, but uh, for, for us, you know, the, the home drives the uh, education and then drives corporate as the transition through the ages occurs. And I know John commented on Mike's vision coming from the iPhone <coughs> all those years ago, but um, why was it so hard to make a video call, you know, when you could call your grandmother on FaceTime and, uh, and that was able to work and you were able to quickly open a document um, pinch and zoom. So that, as that has gotten cheaper and easier and more accepted, um, we've seen the, de the deployment uh, go up. I was talking to uh, Chris here earlier about that and said our cost per room goes down, but our number of rooms and our average sale goes up because so many more people want it. It's not just for boardrooms anymore. Um, that's, that's at least how we're seeing it. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, video conferences have been around for a long time. But it's been primarily, you know, kind of high-end systems that connects, you know, special groups of people together. I, you know, my own vision. I mean, I think what's really driven the adoption of it is just the ease of use, and it's, and you can tell that ease of use of, uh, you know, is driven right down to the consumer in things like FaceTime, where they just hit a button and it starts. And you know, that's really driven back to the enterprise that hey we need to make our solutions at least as easy as that this is what people are they're doing it at home how come I can't do it in the office and and you know most manufacturers now have started embracing this kind of one click to start uh, concept for video conferencing and as you see that roll out it's it is taking off a lot you know I think we'll see um, if you if you think about uh, at least during higher ed K through 12 and higher ed coming through that that age group is you know I have kids and they don't know what not having a video is when they're talking to someone. So if we think about the migration of where this is headed, let's look at our own families and, and look at how they're growing through the, through the world and video is gonna be the number one thing that they're gonna expect. And then if you think about it even further, voice control. Um, you know, so how does all that start playing into to your move? And, and higher education and K through 12, it's gonna hit us first. You know, because that's that's how that's the migration path of the kids. Yeah. Everything I do as a parent is challenged by Alexa. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> my my four-year-old exactly. knows now to ask for validation um, from the kitchen counter. So it's, it's Move that to the corporation, and we're good. Exactly. <laughs> um, speaking of the future and the technology that kind of the youth is going to be brought up with, um, virtual reality. So, do we think this is? going to become part of the classroom or the meeting space? Um, when is it going to happen? Is it going to happen? Well, I, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll start, start on this one. Uh, virtual, I think virtual reality has some, some really cool use, use cases. And I'm not one of the big ones saying that I think it's going to really invade the meeting space. Uh, I, you know, but, uh, but it may. I could be wrong on that one. But you know, it, it's really good when when you know someone wants to visualize some kind of virtual space you know or something or a model in a computer uh, things like that when you have multiple people in a room uh, you know my own thought is you know it kind of maybe gets in the way of those people in the room communicating and, and collaborating with each other but uh, but I, I do think it could help people that are remote to be able to collaborate with the people in the room better uh, so, you know, it may, it may come in in that kind of phase first is kind of what I would see. Uh, you know, for example, when, when we have these big virtual canvases, people in the room, they're looking at the screen, moving things around. Maybe somebody remote could have his goggles on and be looking all over the canvas. You know, that, that's kind of a cool use case for that. Um, that's kind of my own thoughts on that, but we'll, we'll see where it goes, I guess. We, we haven't. 
Go ahead. We haven't seen it in the meeting space as much as the enterprise um, experience centers, consumer brands. Um, <coughs> even if you get landscaping work done at your house now, you can envision it. So they say most people are visual learners. Um, I think when it's otherwise capital intensive to have that, um, where you can benefit from a rendering of virtual reality, we're seeing it. We're seeing the use of things like the planar walls um, in association with goggles and things like that, where otherwise replicating it would be too burdensome financially. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're not seeing it yet in meeting rooms, uh, at least the, not here. The only thing I would say to that is um, ADA compliance and inclusion. So when you think about having a meeting where someone can't get to a space because of whatever it is, um, that goggle then creates that inclusion that they are there in the space. So I think that's, that could be the next transition for, for that in, in the higher ed space. Right. What are some things to consider when trying to support global organizations with multiple offices or organizations with a remote workforce? Well, I mean, one of the things that we see, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of clients that are global, large enterprises. Um, one of them is being able to provide support, uh, you know, kind of a, a, for all of their devices globally, you know, and um, so that's definitely a, a, a challenge. I think we've come up with a pretty good system for that, but, um, you know, the other is these different organizations, they really need ways to collaborate, you know, between their sites and, you um, you know, I think the collaboration products, like one of the ones that we developed and others that are on the market really lean toward that, you know, along with video conferencing and um, having canvases that they can all share and see exact same content at different locations. Uh, I think that, you know, is definitely a big factor in uh, driving, you know, efficiencies in these big organizations. You know. Yeah, for us it's, it's support as well, but support is, is a very uh, loose term, so it's also supporting the supporter. Um, so that's, for us, that's aggregating all of the suppliers, right? Um, there's a software here, there's a, a, a board, a camera, um, there's a number of different touch points. And that is being simplified as an industry, but um, a lot of these global organizations have tier one support, and it's, it's how do we back them up and give them the tools they need to react quickly to their bosses um, or their users, um, and being able to, you know, uh, put all, aggregate all that data into one place and into one portal uh, or one easy to use um, metric that, that they can access readily. What tips can you provide when it comes to future proofing your collaborative spaces? How do you plan to extend the lifetime of solutions? Well, I, I think the one that, uh, that comes to my mind really is, you know, getting solutions that are more software based and so that they kind of grow, you know, with your organization. Uh, you know, and as new capabilities come out in the future, they can kind of just be upgraded into those. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't really help with physical displays. I mean, eventually those, you have to replace those over time, but definitely the infrastructure behind it, if it's more software uh, based, um, you know, then that, that just kind of continues to grow along, you know, uh, you know, over time, so. I would say for higher ed, um, Future proofing means just getting your budget to align and keep up with technology. Because uh, a lot of times um, funding gets in the way of, of technology improvements. And so if you can try and baby step that in slowly and have a migration path and a, and a pattern um, to keep up with technology, I would call that future proofing for, for lack of better words. How has the move towards smaller huddle spaces changed the types of meetings and technology that you're seeing being used in those spaces? So for us, it's been the adoption of unified communication. Um, the number of physical huddle rooms and the cost per square foot to deploy them, uh, that all goes back to the data-driven analytics of you know, getting way away from the 12 and 15 person boardrooms more frequently because the metrics say otherwise. They say the average meeting has four to five people from a team. Um, so now that the, all those teams are enabled with the technology to do their job, um, and we're seeing that with retrofits and upfits and, and new designs, um, it also lowers the cost per square foot, uh, which is you know usually one of the highest um, capital items for a company. So. Um, more technology, easier to use, um, or more rooms with, with less, more rooms with collaborative technology. They're easier to use. 
Yeah, I mean, and we definitely see a huge rise in, you know, adoption of huddle spaces and putting some technology in there. Kind of the, you know, the main difference that, that we see is, you know, in the, in the huddle spaces, it's really a more simplistic technology solution, kind of like what you were talking about. Uh, maybe just something as simple as, as wireless screen sharing and that's it. Uh, you know, and then as you, as you move up the chain into the bigger spaces, the, the level of collaboration uh, typically needs to be higher with more features and capabilities, you know, maybe connecting to remote locations and things like that. Yeah. The only thing I would say for higher ed and, and um, in these small huddle spaces is if, if you take a huddle space in higher ed and put it in a corner where it's not visible and it's not public facing, the students don't seem to gravitate there. They like being in the mix of everybody. So being strategic of where you put huddle spaces in, in higher ed specifically is, is important for, their, to, for them to get used. I made it a point to hide in the back of the library for yeah. college. <laughs> I remember. Um, what are your most common challenges when dealing with collaboration technology? Ease of use. That, I mean, that, that's it. If it's not easy, that's, that's our, our biggest challenge. Yep. Ours is adoption based on application. Um, someone saw something at a conference, wanted it, but didn't understand how to use that tool to solve their business need. Uh, so just making sure that it's the right tool and it's solving the business need. Yeah, I think that's, that's a key one you know, that you're talking about, making sure they really are, you know, that, that they plan to use it to solve a real need. You know, it's not just they, they get it because it's cool. Uh, you know, you install things, uh, put some new technology in because it's really cool, it gets used for a month or something and then people aren't really using it, you know, effectively and they're not seeing the value in it. So it really, they really have to have a need that they're, that they're trying to solve. And I think there's lots of those, but the people just need to have a clear vision of that, you know. So I think that's, it's one of the, one of the key things I think that we try to do and I think everybody should do that is really understand your customer what they what they're really trying to solve and make sure that you're putting things in place to do that right well those are the end of my questions so now I want to open it up to the audience um, do you all have any questions that you would want to ask our panelists Don't be afraid of the cameras. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to, I'll try to ask a question. We had to do it. You can too. What we run into more in the corporate world is, is the home space. But I was talking to a guy at Duke recently, and he said the classes, the majority of the classes are getting smaller and smaller. Are you experiencing the same thing? Huh. Um, no, our classes are getting a little bit larger. But you got to keep in mind that we are a private organization that prides ourselves in teacher to student ratios in small spaces, but we're going from, we don't have three and 400 size classrooms. Um, our classrooms are 15, 18 to 70, you know, or 100. And so when you start, I, I think that's why we're not seeing that shift. Because you're already there. We're, yeah, essentially we're already there. We're, we're already working closely with our students um, in a small environment and not in a, a really large space. Yeah, I, I mean, I do see with, with the education clients that we deal with a push towards smaller classroom sizes. Um, for example, the Texas A&M, uh, the new building they put in, they had a, a mandate from their engineering, you know, the dean of engineering, they said, we don't want any class sizes above 100 students, you know. Um, and, you know, before that, like in some other buildings, they have them that are, you know, 500 mm -hmm. students or something, you know, really high numbers. And, um, you know, of course, that changes a lot of dynamics, you know, because now it's like, well, we have to have more, more classes to, to handle the, the amount of students we have. We have to have more, more professors. But the goal there was just to increase, uh, you know, retention rates of students, you know, the, how, much, how much they learn and graduation rates and all these things. And that, that was their vision that one way, one key, key metric they wanted to, to shoot to was not to have any class sizes bigger than 100. Now, quite a few actually lower than that, too. But, yeah. I do have a quick question. Okay. Um, a lot of the conversation is around the higher ed platform. Um, generally, they are mentioned the corporate platform. 
So taking the benefits that you've openly spoken about today for higher ed in more of a corporate setting, what do you advise for corporate environments that may not have that tier one support, but also stay aligned with the ever-changing needs in the corporate arena? Um, what advice do you have for that? So from our perspective, touching all endpoints is um, vendor selection and reviewing the application and the roadmap. So understanding where you are today, what your initiatives are, and things that are coming down the pike. Um, so that's the planning side of it. And then on the back end is, you know, picking the right supplier that matches your, your level of enterprise, right? Is that 24 by seven? Is it global? Is it regional? Is it national? Um, and making sure they have the correct software process, software and processes <coughs> in place um, to do that, to act as your tier one support. Um, and we can give you a bunch of information on that offline. And I know Chris here is uh, you know, familiar with that as well. Yeah, and I, I uh, didn't mean for us to be solely talking about education. Actually, corporate space is actually a bigger portion of our business than, than the education market, even though they're both pretty big. But, um, and we, you know, I think in the education side, we probably do see a lot of people having their own support staff that they, that they want to go to first before they come to kind of our support staff. But in the enterprise, it's, uh, you know, most of the time it's kind of the opposite. You know, the enterprise tends to rely on our support team to handle issues you know, in their rooms remotely. Uh, and uh, you know, a lot of times, and, and that's the key thing about having monitoring systems and data, because we actually know about problems that happen before, you know, before people walk in the room in the morning. And so we try to take care of those kind of problems. So I would recommend that you, you, know, you try to partner with companies that, that have those kind of solutions available. Um, you know, the enterprise also sees it a lot of times as, hey, we're gonna add these new, uh, you know, all, the, all this new technology in, that means I got a lot more work to do. So they, they like, you know, some of them really like the idea of, oh, you know, the, this group is going to handle the support for that for me, and I can just kind of call them when there's an issue. You know, so both of those, we see that happen a lot, actually. So. And even with things such as collaborative, I mean, most enterprise uh, integration partners now are under um, both uh, immediate SLA and on-site SLAs, but it's the ability to be proactive and be ahead of it that is the most beneficial we find at, at this point. Just like if your phones or your switch, your routers go down. So you talked about two challenges, um, ease of use and then adoption. Um, if it is easy to use, what are you doing to wait for us like, with, for adoption to get people, you know, people that have been doing the same thing for years and years and years and years to switch over to something different? Uh, it's a great question. Um, so two years ago was the time that I actually had enough data to talk about and to take it forward to the faculty and say, hey, here's how we're using these spaces. And so the first couple were really challenging. You know, they didn't really believe you. They didn't understand. You know, they just wanted what they wanted and had what they, they wanted to replace what they had. Um, now what we're seeing is, hey, I've heard from Joe that or Dr. Smith that this room is always up and always running and it's so easy and all I do is go in and I click here and, I, and I'm going how can we get that how can we get that um, so that that's one way our other the other way we're doing is we have a space called or a um, committee called the learning spaces committee that learning spaces committee I'm the chair of and what we do is outreach 100% outreach we go out and reach out to these folks we join their departmental meetings and we show them that simplicity also equals reliability. And you put those two words together and the faculty members are on it and, the, and they just go with it because then it doesn't interrupt their class. Well, five years ago or 10 years ago, you could teach class without tech. You can't teach class today without technology. Every single class pretty much is, has some type of technology. Our next challenge is digital um, media. That's, that's the next the next thing to tackle. Does that answer your question? Yeah, good. Okay. Great. If we don't have any other questions, um, thank you again, panelists, for joining me up here, and thank you all for being here.